We talked about the S&P briefly crossing 6,000 again today, but a lot of analysts believe that stocks can still propel higher further. Evercore, one of those latest, right? Seeing that President-elect Donald Trump's plans propelling the S&P 500 another 11 percent through the middle of next year. Joining us now is David Bonson, managing partner of the Bonson Group. David, do you see that? Further gains? Well, it's entirely possible. The problem with those projections is that there's two components to what drives stock market returns. There's the earnings themselves, which are often unpredictable, but especially the valuation on those earnings, which is definitely unpredictable. And frankly, they're very, very high. Mm -hmm. The top 10 companies in the S&P 500 right now, before this week, where the Dow's up 2,000 points, we're trading over 50 times earnings. So I think you have a valuation issue regardless of his president, but you definitely have a good growth backdrop that's better than we had four days ago. I hear you on that. I'm a little concerned about something, and I think you're the right person to talk to about it, which is the Fed cut interest rates by a quarter point yesterday. We don't know where we're going to necessarily go from here. But Trump is, um, with respect to his policy, already announced you know, tax cuts for corporations and for individuals. He's going to put money back into people's pockets. Since inflation hasn't cooled yet, I'm a little concerned that that, that extra surplus people are going to have is going to heat things up again. How do you balance that and manage it? Um, Jackie, I do not believe inflation is caused by people having more of their money. Okay. I think inflation is caused by too much money chasing too few goods, and that when more people have more money, it promotes production. It creates the goods and services that offset. So if everybody having a job was inflationary, then we could solve for that very quickly. Um, economic growth is anti-inflationary. The issue is whether or not you're getting productive growth. Go the government printing a bunch of money and throwing it out there and then mm. transfer payments. 70% of our budget of a federal government is spent of giving other people money. Some of it's legit. Some of it I don't think is, but it's not productive. So I don't think tax cuts create inflation. Okay. Um, and, and ultimately, I think most of the inflation issues we had from supply chain and the, all the extra spending and the labor shortages, those things have already, largely been resolved. The Fed right now is not setting rate policy. So just real quick, if I, I just want to make sure that I understand this. Basically, what you're saying is, yes, people will have more money to go after the goods, but the growth that's going to come from the economy is going to mm. create a supply-demand balance where we don't necessarily see the prices go up. Or Unless one believes that producers and entrepreneurs are not going to be there to meet demand. And okay. that's where just economically us classical economists believe by definition consumption follows production. I like that answer. It's a, and it's a great question because a lot of times you know, the, the guys who do the analysis treat tax cuts and spending like they're the same thing and they're going to have the same effect. But the point is, one of them creates productivity and the other doesn't. And that makes all the difference when it comes to prices. And I think the lesson in history here is the 1980s. Paul Volcker gets some credit for breaking inflation with higher rates. Ronald Reagan doesn't get enough credit for breaking inflation with supply side tax cuts mm. because it stimulated uh, more production of goods and services. Real, real quick, can I ask you this? Um, you're, you're, you're not a Trump guy necessarily, yeah. OK, but you're a business guy. The regime has changed. He's in office. How do folks like you in the business world adapt to that fact? Let me be very clear. And all my clients know this, but I want to make sure everyone understands, especially my friends on set. Um, I love so many of Trump's policies, and I always say so. And when there's something I disagree with, I say so. Yeah, and so these days, right. that made you sometimes not a Trump guy because I would be critical when I thought it was warranted. Look, um, most of the issues are temperamental, behavioral. Policy-wise, he is intuitively a negotiator, and he's intuitively interested in economic growth. That part, I'm yeah. very much aligned with the president. A lot of Wall Street right now is very excited. That's been very obvious. It's not just because of tax cuts. It's deregulation. It's energy independence. Right. And it's a sentiment that is pro-America and a sentiment that is meritocratic. That's where a lot of this DEI stuff over the last four right. years is underrated in what created the results Tuesday night in the election, but also my optimism for the future. That's you good. talked the way you're talking and sort of what we've been doing on set all week sounds like Trump 2.0, really similar policies to what we heard first time around. But I feel like we're in a little bit of a different environment. The Fed had, mm. I think, just hiked interest rates yeah. in 2016. Now we have a Fed cutting. Yeah. Inflation looks drastically different now than it did in 2016. Yeah. How mm. do you prepare for policy? Is it Trump 2.0 or are we wrong? Trump 2.0 is largely going to be defined by personnel because personnel is policy. Mm -hmm. And so the next few weeks are so important. I was really encouraged last night with this election of Susie. I think she's outstanding. Huh. I adore her. She is an administrator, an executor. That's what he needs. He needs a grown-up in that room. Yep. 
Um, now we're going to get a Treasury Secretary announcement. My sources tell me later today. Um, that's a big key. So who he's picking in NEC, uh, National Economic Council, Treasury, some of these departments is going to matter a great deal. Any top names on Treasury for you? <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> the, the names that people are hearing are largely the ones being circulated. And I'm a big fan of Scott Besson. I think he'd be a great pick. I think he's an ideologue. He's a philo- phil- Brian talks about philosophy mattering yeah. economics. Yeah, we got to get a little of that in today. You're my guy. Well, no, when you said, yeah, when you said we're going to get Treasury today. <laughs> so good. I was, looking at, I, I was like, are you like kidding? We get treasury I did not today? Know that. It's what I'm hearing. And um, I do like Scott as the, the pick a lot. I personally would be disappointed if it were Bob Lighthizer, who's more of a protectionist nationalist. I think he's looking at Bob more in commerce. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to like every single person. That's OK. But there's some that are key that I'm going to like. And look, Cudlow, when he was at NEC and Gary Cohn and I thought Secretary Mnuchin did a good job. You want a couple Wall Street guys there, but you don't want all Wall Street. Right. Right? Mm. But you need people who know capital. Capital markets. Yes. And, and it's a very important part of the economy. So we're watching all that. And like you said, adults in the room yeah. to help guide us forward. David Bonson, we appreciate Thank it. You. Thank Thanks you. So much. Great stuff.